William Fry completed his PhD in sociology at Brown University in 1974. His academic career began at Rutgers, then moved him across the country to the University of Washington, then to Wisconsin-Madison, and back to the East Coast to SUNY Albany before he settled down at the University of Michigan for more than 30 years of work in the university's Population Studies Center in the Institute for Social Research. Along the way, he spent shorter research visits at the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis outside Vienna in Austria and at the Population Reference Bureau and at Child Trends, both in Washington, D.C. This article, written during his long career at Michigan, well and truly upset the apple cart of research on the effects of immigrants in the economy of the United States. Once he published it, everybody started to say, well, of course, and also, why didn't I think of that? But until this article came along, nobody had thought of the important point that he makes, and this article is one of those milestones that shifted the entire focus of debate in a scientific field. Before Bill Fry wrote this article about immigration in the United States, a lively debate has been going on for decades. This debate goes on today, often powered more by ignorance and prejudice than by facts and figures. The focus of this debate concerns what impact immigrants have on American society. While this impact can appear in many ways, from changes in the language we speak or the religions we follow, to the people we find in our school classrooms, or even the marriage partners we choose in life, but in America you are what you do, and what you do is measured above all by your job and how much money you make, so the heart of this debate always has been about whether immigrants take jobs away from native-born American workers. Half a century ago, as the current immigration wave was just getting started in the 1960s, this debate flared to life again in the United States. It had died down for a few decades while restrictions on migration created several decades of very low immigration into the country. But the revival of the immigrant stream revived the same ferocious arguments that had raged at the start of the century. The drastic legislative solutions of the 1920s. While this debate penetrated the consciousness of many individual citizens of the country, policy discussions like this typically are driven by the organized efforts of large groups. Two groups in particular were very concerned about the possible effects of immigrants on the American labor force. One of these groups is composed of the American Federation of Labor, formed in the 1880s to organize unions among craftsmen, and the Congress of Industrial Organizations, formed during the Great Depression in 1935 to protect industrial workers. The two groups merged in 1955 and have been working since then to advance the interests of people who work for wages in the U.S. economy. AFL-CIO was concerned about the start of a new immigration wave because unions worried that more competition from millions of new immigrants would drive down wages and that unemployment rates might also increase as the labor force expanded. Similar worries also began to bother the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People because two-thirds of the black population in the United States has been concentrated in the bottom one-third of the economy for as long as anyone has been keeping track of the figures, and NAACP leaders feared that the competition from immigrants for jobs would affect black workers much more strongly than white workers, many of whom had shifted into white-collar and professional occupations. Both the AFL-CIO and the NAACP decided to invest some of their treasuries in research in the 1960s to find out, first of all, whether they had real grounds for these fears or whether they were just worried over nothing, and then, if there was a real problem, what to do about it. One of the scholars who responded to the offer of research support from the unions and the NAACP was Tom Espenshade, who looked around for a reasonable way to answer their questions. He decided that if immigrants were taking jobs away from native-born American workers, this should show up in measurable results in the areas where this was happening. After checking the figures on immigration, he decided to focus on the state of California. Since California had then, and still has today, the highest share of foreign-born immigrants of any state in the country, he reasoned that he should be able to find the effects of all these immigrants in California in particular. The two things that the unions and the NAACP were most worried about were wages and unemployment rates.
If the immigrants were hurting American workers, this should show up as slower wage growth over time in California than in the rest of the country, or perhaps higher unemployment rates in California than in the rest of the country, or perhaps even both outcomes at once. If this turned out to be true, then the AFL-CIO and the NAACP would have to gear up for a real fight. So Espen Shade and his colleagues lined up all the employment data they could lay their hands on and did their calculations and published their results in several scholarly papers and professional journals. Their conclusions? They found that in California during the 1960s, as immigrants began to pour into the state, wages actually rose faster there than in the rest of the country. Unemployment rates in California also were lower than in the rest of the country. He reported back to the AFL-CIO and the NAACP and told them to quit worrying about the immigrants, because apparently immigration into California had been good for the workers already there, not bad for them. Of course, these groups were skeptical of the results. How could this be? Everybody knows that immigrants take jobs away from real Americans, right? What do you mean immigrants are good for the workers who are already there? That didn't make much sense to them. But in fact, lots of economists have been studying migration for a long time and finding pretty much these same results. The trouble was that they had not been looking at immigrants from other countries. They had been looking at internal migration within the country, and especially at different cities, at some cities that were growing and other cities that were losing population. Every local chamber of commerce in every town and city in the United States has long nurtured a deeply ingrained gut feeling that growth and expansion is good. More people are always better. The motto of the Chamber of Commerce of Greater Boston is bigger, better, brighter Boston. And this gut feeling that growth is good was based on decades of solid research by economists. That research reveals what has become known as the multiplier or ripple effect of growth. If one new person moves to town and starts working there, that new person takes one job. If the new arrival starts his or her own business, this is also a new job, so it hasn't taken away a job from anybody else. But even if the new arrival takes an existing job, the multiplier effect still applies. That person takes the paycheck at the end of each pay period and spends it in many ways. Some of these involve paying for things like food, rent, clothing, recreation, furniture, a car, and other purchases that spread the paycheck out through other businesses in the town. These businesses then spend their income on further transaction, and the ripples spread outward into the community. Economists calculate that for each new worker added in a community, this ripple effect creates another extra four-tenths of a job. No wonder the chambers of commerce love growth. On the other hand, every job lost when a steel mill closes in Pittsburgh or somewhere else in the Rust Belt removes that paycheck and that lost paycheck eventually also ripples out through the community. This negative multiplier effect costs an additional four-tenths of a job lost for every steel worker who packs up and moves from Pittsburgh to work in a fast food restaurant somewhere in Texas. Since Tom Esmanshade is an economist, he knew all about this research on the multiplier effects of city growth or decline within the United States. All he had to do was to explain to the union officials and the NAACP leaders that immigrants apparently had the same effect in California. Each new immigrant who arrived and went to work created the same sort of multiplier effect, creating additional jobs and higher wages for the workers who were already there. But there was a catch to this research, even though nobody, including Esmond Shade or any of his colleagues, thought about it at the time. There was an assumption underlying the analysis that he and the other scholars were doing. That assumption was that local labor markets are self-contained, hermetically sealed test tubes within which we can observe competition for jobs, multiplier effects, and other economic phenomena. If people were thrown out of work by new immigrants, they would show up in the unemployment office in town, and we would count them there. But wait a minute. Didn't these migrants themselves come from outside that local labor market? If people can come in from the outside, surely people on the inside also might be able to leave that local labor market. Then they would never show up at all, whether they had jobs or were unemployed. The Great Depression in the 1930s devastated the American economy and threw millions of people out of work. The Dust Bowl in the Midwest, caused by ignorant and greedy agricultural practices, magnified the problem. 
and the response filled America's highways with itinerant legions of people rattling around the country as best they could, looking for work. So maybe we would never see the effects of immigrants into California if the people affected by this influx just packed up and left the state. This is the key missing point that Bill Fry seized upon for, for this article. I'm going to locate Fry's approach to studying migration among the various theoretical constellations that were available to him, we can start by placing him in the camp of the rational choice theorists who concentrate on the attitudes, beliefs, and motives of the migrants themselves. For example, Everett Lee is well known for this general framework of explaining migration decisions in terms of push factors from the places that migrants leave, pull factors from the places to which they move, and the kinds of barriers or assistance in between that might make such movements harder or easier. Within this larger framework, Fry built on a handful of other studies that had appeared just before he wrote this article, attempting to link immigration of foreign-born persons to the internal labor force movements of the existing American population. There are several ways that we could make such a link. The immigrants might be viewed either as a push factor driving out native-born workers or as a pull factor drawing them into an area. After all, if there's something that attracts immigrant workers, it might also attract workers from other places inside the country at the same time. But Fry takes the push perspective. His working hypothesis that guides this study is that the immigrants arrive in a local labor market, mostly with limited language proficiency and job skills, and enter the competition for jobs with low-skilled native-born workers. They push some of these native-born workers out of the workforce. The reason that Espenshade and others did not find these effects when they looked for them, for example in California, is that the displaced workers then packed up and moved out of the state, looking for work somewhere else when they wouldn't have to compete with immigrants. This is the new angle that Fry wants to explore the piece of the puzzle that was missing from the earlier research literature. People were not yet thinking about internal migration as a possible reaction to the increased, com increased competition posed by the rising wave of immigrants. If he could find a pattern showing out-migration of native-born people away from the same places where immigrants were arriving, this might be evidence that such displacement effects were real. In addition to this straightforward economic argument about labor market competition, Fry adds some other dimensions to bolster his arguments that immigrants might scare people into moving away. We have never had any trouble finding a certain fear and loathing of immigrants in the hearts of some people in the United States, no matter how ironic this might seem coming from people who themselves are usually only a generation or two away from the immigration of their own ancestors into the country. Speaking about the nouveau riche Kennedys in Massachusetts in the early 1900s, after Joe Kennedy made his fortune smuggling whiskey in from Canada during Prohibition, a very proper back bay dowager in Boston once referred to the family as those low street Irish. When Germans first began coming to America, the British descendants already here were convinced that the brutal animal natures of the Germans could never be overcome so that they would become fully civilized. And of course, anyone arriving from Italy or Ireland was not even regarded as white until several generations of struggle finally boosted them across that color barrier. Respectable social scientists linked immigrants with murder and robbery in Chicago, pointing out that both immigrants and crime were concentrated in the same neighborhoods. It was not until 1950 that another famous landmark article by W.S. Robinson demonstrated that it is a fallacy to infer the behavior of individuals from such neighborhood-level correlations. He showed that in Chicago, the same neighborhoods did indeed have high crime rates and high shares of immigrant residents, but that if you drill down and look at individuals and schools instead of neighborhoods, it turns out that it is not the immigrants who are involved in the crimes. They were there because the housing was cheap and landlords discriminated against them in other parts of the city. The crime rate would have been high in those neighborhoods anyway, even without the immigrants. This study has become famous for documenting the ecological fallacy as an error in our thinking. But such a correlation of immigrants and crime doesn't have to be real in order to have real consequences. 
for I can still argue that if people believe this is true, when they see immigrants coming, they still might start packing up the dishes and thinking about moving to another state. In addition to direct labor market competition and perceptions about possible increases in crime, Fry also points out that good old reliable prejudice and racism may also put a finger on the scales, so that people already living in a place where migrants show up might just decide to move away because they don't like the looks of these new people. They talk funny, they smell funny from eating funny food, they don't go to our churches, and if we stay here, their children might very well start running around with our children after school and might even end up married to them. So what are we waiting for? Put the kids in the car and let's get out of here. All in all, it sounds like a plausible line of reasoning. But does this hypothetical reaction by people to the arrival of immigrants, to the actual labor market competition, or to the imagined social and cultural consequences of their presence, really cause people to pack up and move away? For a social scientist like Fry, it's not enough to just set up a potential hypothesis like this. One must then do the hard work of assembling actual empirical evidence and finding out whether such a line of thought actually might correspond to something happening in the world around us. Until then, it's just more smoke and mirrors in the middle of a long tradition of smoke and mirrors in American public discourse. About the state-level research by Espenshade and other scholars, Fry decided to start testing ideas with state-level data. The basic logic of his analysis is very simple. States with lots of immigrants arriving during a decade should also see lots of native-born U.S. workers bailing out and leaving. Fortunately, the U.S. Census Bureau asked a question on the questionnaires of the decennial census in 1990 and also on current population surveys in the intervening years, asking all respondents where they were living five years ago. If the person was living somewhere else five years before they filled out the survey form, they would show up as migrants. This provides measures of both kinds of mobility that Fry wants to study. Immigrants would answer that they were living outside the United States five years earlier. People who moved away from California, for example, would show up in Atlanta or in Texas or in some other state and would answer that five years earlier they'd been living in California. And what do we find? In the top panel of his Table 1, Fry lists the top six states for immigration in the five-year period leading up to the 1990 census on the left side of the table and again for the five-year period after the census on the right side of the table. At least that is what the table tells us he has done. But if you look carefully, you will see that he's already fudging these results somewhat because he doesn't list Florida among these top six states. Florida should have ranked third among high immigration states before 1990 and fourth after 1990. It is included in the bottom half of the table instead. The bottom half of the table ranks states by the number of people they gained from other states within the United States, that is, net internal migration. Here, Florida is the champion in both time periods. This might be why it is listed there instead of in the top half. But the fact that it could be listed in either place is already a sign that we're not going to find a perfect fit of the evidence to Fry's immigrant push hypothesis. In the top half of his Table 1, though, we do see some striking results. In both five-year periods, five out of the six states that gained the most immigrants, again, not counting Florida, also experienced large net flows of out-migrants in the native-born population. New York State gained over a million immigrants in the 10-year interval, but at the same time lost nearly two million native-born Americans from its population. Only California prior to 1990 and Texas after 1990 show net in-migration of Americans into high immigration states. On the other hand, in the bottom half of the table, we see lots of states that large numbers of net in-migrants in their native-born populations, meaning that people on balance were moving there from other places, like New York, and nearly all of these states showed very small numbers of immigrants arriving. So the general idea that native-born Americans were moving away from places where the immigrants came in and arriving instead in other states where few immigrants were going fits well with Fry's idea that these internal migrants might have been running away from the immigrants. Except that is for Florida. Florida gained more net migrants from other U.S. states than anywhere else in the country in both time periods 
and yet also received some of the top counts of immigrants. Florida might even be used as evidence for the opposite hypothesis, that immigrants stimulate the economy and attract internal migrants who want to enjoy the same climate of economic growth. California before 1990 and Texas after 1990 show this same pattern of reinforcing flows of both immigrants and native-born net migrants. What are we to make of these glaring exceptions to Fry's hypothesis? What does Fry do when he sees this? Fry's first answer is to say that states, especially the largest states like Florida, California, or Texas, are just too big to be considered a single labor market for the purposes of this argument about competition and displacement. This actually sounds right, and probably applies to other states like New York that at least on the surface seem to fit his initial hypothesis. So Fry steps down from the level of statewide totals to look at specific metropolitan areas around the country. These metro areas make much more sense as labor markets, so this actually sounds like a better test of what he thinks might be going on. This time there's no more funny business with Florida. Miami goes up in the top half of his table too, where it belongs with the other high immigration cities. Other Florida cities like Tampa and Orlando go into the bottom half of the table. This might help to explain what we saw in the previous Table 1. Immigrants apparently were going to Miami, while U.S. born-in migrants were moving to the middle and northern parts of the state. Florida, indeed, was too big to use as a single unit of analysis, and when we split up the different big cities in the state, they go in one half of the table or the other. Again, we see some large negative numbers for many of the cities with the largest immigration totals in the top half of the table. New York City behaves just like New York State, which is probably not surprising when we consider that a lot of the migration of any sort into and out of New York State probably applies to New York City. But again, there are exceptions. Cities that gained both immigrants and native-born in migrants, as might happen if immigrants represented a pull rather than a push factor for internal migration. Before 1990, these include Miami, as well as Dallas and Washington, D.C., after 1990, both Dallas and Houston and Texas are positive for both types of arrivals. On the other hand, the bottom half of this metro area table shows very consistently that all of the biggest gains of in-migration by native-born American residents took place in cities with very small numbers of immigrants arriving. These include Atlanta, Tampa, Las Vegas, Phoenix, Portland, Oregon, Denver, Orlando, and other hot growth areas that had not yet turned into immigration destinations to any large extent. So the idea that Americans seemed to be moving to places without a lot of new immigrant arrivals is pretty generally true across the whole country. No doubt this finding in particular is what led Fry to refer to Balkanization in the title of his article. The Balkans, after all, in the mountainous region of southeastern Europe, have become synonymous with the tendency of groups to live in little inward-facing enclaves of ethnically homogenous people, suspicious and hostile of all others different from themselves. These little rival populations in the Balkans have been killing each other over every excuse they could find for hundreds and even thousands of years. So it is sobering to have Fry use this label to describe a possible trend in American life. If Americans start sorting themselves out into distinct geographic concentrations based on ethnic or other kinds of identities, eventually we might slip into the same sort of mutual misunderstandings, suspicions, hostility, and even self-defeating violence towards one another. That, at least, is the implication that comes from a title like Fry has chosen. In his figure one, he displays the results of his analysis from another angle. This time he shows us the cities that have received lots of immigrants but were losing native-born Americans as unfilled circles. Los Angeles, Chicago, New York, Boston, and so on. Then he adds shapes filled in with black as places that were gaining mostly net migration from other places within the United States. They clearly are not the same places. This then is his basic thesis. The cities that were gaining most of the foreign immigrants near the end of the 20th century also were losing native-born population. And that native-born population apparently was moving to other cities, cities where there were not a lot of new immigrants coming in. He interprets these patterns as support for his hypothesis that immigrants were themselves a push factor that stimulated out-migration of native-born people 
and that as a result, the country was at least to some extent sorting itself out on the basis of nativity and ethnicity into different separate locations. In a word, balkanizing. Since this article first appeared, it has generated a regular industry of related research, as many other scholars have sought to test Fry's idea, often arguing they have evidence that he was wrong, but sometimes also arguing that he was right. One thing is for certain, though. It is now impossible to talk about the impact of immigrants on the American economy without considering the issue of migration.